Governor Cuomo has said, it's time to reimagine New York. We aren't just rebuilding our infrastructure, but taking advantage of this truly unique moment to rethink how we can improve. One of the first steps in that process is to bring together thought leaders and experts to have conversations about the past, present, and future. It is in that model that we have organized today's webinar with a focus on the industry most directly impacted by the global pandemic, healthcare. Rockefeller Institute is co-hosting today's event with Empire State College. Today's moderator is Jeff Ritter, an assistant professor of healthcare leadership at Empire State College. Jeff has over 25 years of experience in the healthcare industry. He has served as vice president for Cigna and government programs and marketing director for several healthcare organizations. And with that, I'd like to hand this over to Jeff who will introduce today's panelists and facilitate today's conversation. Thank you, Laura, and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'd like to introduce the panelists and our first panelist is uh, Dr. Barry Eisenberg, associate professor in the School of Graduate Studies at SUNY Empire State College and program coordinator and academic advisor for the MBA in healthcare leadership. Barry has extensive background in healthcare management. He established and oversaw a management develop development program at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center in New York and later served as vice president of human resources uh, and vice president of operations at Un uh, Union Hospital in New Jersey. He is co-author of Mastering Leadership a vital resource for healthcare organizations. Most recently, um, uh, Dr. Eisenberg has presented on and written about how the widespread co consolidation of the healthcare industry can inform our understanding of similar trends in higher education and the media industry. Our second panelist is Dr. Michael K. Guzmano, visiting fellow at the Rockefeller Institute of Government and an associate professor at Rutgers, the State University of New Jersey. Dr. Guzmano is also a research scholar at the Hastings Center. His research examines the politics of health and social policy in the United States. In addition, he co-directs the World Cities Project, which compares large city health systems across the world. Dr. Guzmano is the author of Healthcare in World Cities, New York, London, and Paris, Healthy Voices, Unhealthy Silence, and, and Growing Older in World Cities. He was a Robert Wood Johnson Scholar in Health Policy Research at Yale University. Dr. Guzmano also, also received his doctorate in political science from the University of Maryland, College Park in 1995. And our third uh, panelist is Courtney Burke, Chief Operating Officer of the Healthcare Association of New York State, Haney's. She oversees all of Haney's operations and ensures optimal alignment of the association's various functions from healthcare policy and advocacy to quality improvement and data analysis. Ms. Burke comes to Haney's with an extensive background in healthcare operations and policy with a, with, uh, with a career that has included executive positions uh, in government and healthcare provide, in the healthcare provider sector. Ms. Burke served as senior vice president and chief strategy officer at Albany Medical Center, New York State's the uh, Deputy Secretary for Health Commissioner of New York State Office for the People of Development Disabilities, Director for the Rockefeller Institute of Government's New York State Health Policy Research Center, and as Senior Research Scientist in the Rockefeller Institute's Health and Medicaid Studies Program. Uh, we've invited the panelists to prepare brief presentations. We invite the audience to submit any questions in the Q&A feature found at the bottom of the taskbar. I will be addressing uh, these to our panelists during the Q&A at the end. And I thank you and I'll turn it back over to Laura. Barry, why don't you take it? Mm. Okay, sure. Thanks. Uh, welcome everybody. Uh, give me half a second to share my screen. Whoops. Um, I'm getting a message that says the host disabled participant sh uh, screen sharing. So, okay, I think we're back in business. Um, oops. Okay, oops. 
So there we go. Um, welcome everybody. Sorry for the quick mishap. Hopefully that'll be the only technical glitch that we have for today. Um, Jeff, thank you very much. Uh, thanks very much to Laura and to Alex for organizing this webinar. Uh, I think as Laura said, we're in the midst of the greatest health crisis in our lifetime. Uh, and that's increasingly becoming an understatement, sadly. So I'm grateful to the Rockefeller Institute for bringing us together for this important discussion. Um, and I'm honored to be participating with Michael and Courtney. I look forward to hearing their presentations uh, as well. Um, if we're thinking about how we've responded to the COVID-19 pandemic and imagining how we move forward, it's important for us to know how we got here, what led to this moment um, and what can, we can learn from it. So as the initial part of our three presentations, I'm gonna spend a few minutes taking a look at the historical trends and milestones that shape the nature of the, of the response to this pandemic. Um, and I hope everybody can see the slides. I think so, judging from my end. Um, a starting point for this discussion, it, it almost feels arbitrary. You can pick almost any point in time, but um, we could look at policy development throughout the 19, uh, 1900s. Um, we can look more recently at the Affordable Care Act, but I think a place to just begin the discussion is in the late 1970s and, and the early uh, 1980s. Um, it was at that point that most of the structures that we have now for our healthcare system are in place. Um, Employer-based um, coverage uh, had been in place for uh, about 40 years. Um, Medicare and Medicaid, and Medicaid had been in place, you know, for uh, you know for quite some time, and at that point had matured. Um, and much of the change that occurred after, even with the Affordable Care Act, was pretty much based upon those systems, building out those structures even more. But you take a look back in the 19, uh, late 1970s and early 80s, um, healthcare inflation was running rampant. Uh, you can see in 1975, it was at 12.1%. Uh, the consumer price index was 9.1%. Actually, that was a pretty unusual year in, uh, you know, during which the um, uh, inflation rate in healthcare and the CPI were that close. Most of it looked a little bit more like 1982 during that time when you can see that healthcare inflation was running at three, four, sometimes five times the rate of the consumer price index. And so there was great pressure to control costs. Um, and it came from, you know, the pressure was uh, exerted in multiple directions. It, there were um, policy changes uh, across uh, in healthcare policy. Um, that were occurring to try to rein in costs and individual hospitals were also making efforts uh, to create some efficiencies. Um, uh, many of you may be familiar with uh, the diagnostic, and I'm not gonna go into too much detail because of the limited time, um, but you know, many of you may be familiar with the DRG system, the Diagnostic Related Group System, which, uh, which was uh, adopted by Medicare in 1983, that was a watershed year. Um, the uh, diagnostic related group was a program by Medicare uh, in which Medicare um, developed roughly 500 give or take diagnoses and said, we are gonna create fixed fees for those, uh, you know, for, those, for those diagnoses. And so hospitals, this was the first time that the payer was beginning to play a more pronounced role uh, in the determination of pricing and hospitals had to respond to that. Um, that was extended with uh, the, you know, with what ultimately became the ubiquitous expansion of managed care. Um, they extended that prospective payment, that shift away again from fee for service to prospective payment, in which the payer established limits for, um, you know, for what they would pay for certain diagnoses. Um, and uh, managed care also had that other piece to it, which is they said that well, rather than the patient uh, making decisions about where in the system he or she should go for care, we'll assign that to a so-called expert, a primary care physician, uh, who theoretically could make uh, exercise decision-making more judiciously and in so doing, theoretically, underscore theoretically, um, save money. Um, so, uh, you know, all this together was coupled with hospitals' efforts to create, uh, to create efficiencies. Uh, and they did lots of stuff back then um, they uh, um, uh, uh, 
you know, they could no longer, for example, uh, amass major inventories of supplies. So we saw efficiency systems, um, you know, come in in an effort to, uh, you know, to, uh, to replace all of that with things like just-in-time deliveries. Uh, and efficiency became the, uh, you know, the watchword of the day. Um, and the other, uh, another thing that hospitals did was try to um, reduce the length of stay, the amount of time that hospitals would, uh, hospitals would keep a patient. Um, the thinking was uh, that if a patient can get all the care that they need in five days, and pretty much that's all that uh, the managed care companies and Medicare would pay for, they had to figure out ways to do that. So length of stay reduction occupied a good deal of the activity that, uh, you know, that hospitals were, uh, you, you know, were attempting to do to see if they could control the rate of, uh, of cost increase. But of all of the landscape changing things that took place, uh, we were at the time on the precipice of a major realignment of healthcare with hospitals uh, seeking economies of scale through mergers and acquisitions. So I think you could see here um, the number of acquisitions per year beginning in 2000. You know, of course, this activity started to occur before that, um, but pretty much ramped up as we got into the late 90s and has continued on a relatively unabated base, uh, basis uh, through today. Um, note also that as we move from the early part of that period to the late part of that period, those transactions increasingly included multiple entities. And by that, I mean systems buying other systems, merging with other systems. So the number of facilities that were in those transactions increased uh, as, we, you know, as we move uh, to the more recent time period. Here, uh, I think you can see that uh, you know, this, this, this graph sort of reinforces that notion of multiple entities being exchanged uh, in a single transaction. Note that in just the 10 year period from 2008 to 2018, the average revenue for the seller and the seller is considered the smaller of the entities in the transaction. Uh, that rose fourfold from a little over 100 million to over 400 million. So, you know, thus we're seeing uh, a continued enlargement of healthcare systems over time. In this slide, and I'm sure some of you are familiar with the names on the left side of this list, but in this slide, you can see the number of beds controlled by the top 10 systems. And, you know, if you start thinking about um, the value of each of those beds, what it costs to operate, what kind of revenue a healthcare system could expect uh, for each of those beds, um, it, you know, those numbers have an extraordinary influence. Um, think of how much of a driver that sort of calculation means when those systems engage in strategic planning uh, and think about the political and economic clout that those numbers provide. So, you know, this, uh, uh, you can see just very considerable numbers of beds being operated by these large systems. So where does this leave us? Uh, today. For about 100 years, the nation has been embroiled in a debate about whether the health healthcare system is most properly governed by the government or by market forces. Um, the role of government is conditioned by the question that's philosophically central to this debate. Is healthcare a right or is it a privilege? Um, and we've sought in this country to have it both ways. Um, public opinion polls tend to show that we're moving in the direction of seeing healthcare as a, privilege, as a right rather, um, but the market forces, uh, you know, uh, are, are, you know, so foundational to our system that moving those out or shrinking those has proven to be extraordinarily difficult. And I'll talk about that in just a minute. So for the purpose of gaining an appreciation for where we are, uh, are today and to understand the circumstances that contributed to the response to the pandemic, I'd like to just touch on uh, four trends that are historically rooted in the healthcare system. Uh, the first is that, and I'll have individual slides for each of these, but the first is that there's been relatively unrestrained growth uh, of systems. The, uh, the second is that uh, a market-based culture has emerged as relatively dominant. And I know Michael's gonna be discussing this a little bit more fully in his, in his presentation. 
Uh, third, that uh, boards of directors have become more and more centralized. And finally, that competi uh, competition supersedes coordination. So relatively unrestrained system expansion. Um, you know, system expansion, um, if, you, if you go back a couple of the slides and see some of those trends, you'll see that um, merger and acquisition transactions, you know, those have occurred without, without real uh, interruption. Um, by and large, the regulatory bodies that have oversight responsibility, like the Federal Trade Commission, they have not stood in the way. Um, uh, and for the most part, three arguments have been used uh, that have successfully steered, uh, steered proposals for mergers uh, and consolidation activity through. The first argument is that the public is gonna be better served by having a more comprehensive system. Um, and in a more comprehensive system with more components, care could be coordinated, ultimately care will be um, better. That has been a, a, an argument central to proposal development for mergers and acquisitions. The second um, is that we, as a proposer of a merger and acquisition, we're not seeking to dominate the market, no. Uh, we're looking to create complementarity of services or services that, um, uh, services that will connect in uh, various uh, uh, contiguous geographic areas. And the third um, is that by virtue of our size and scope and reach, we will be able to serve communities that would otherwise uh, go without care and go without medical attention. So um, when you think about it, who can resist those arguments? Um, pretty powerful. And for the most part, the oversight uh, bodies have, uh, you know, have pretty much given the okay. So uh, in a market-based culture, we'll talk about this for just a second, uh, all elements um, or all businesses are expected to perform well. If you're, think about it, if you're a hospital system spending half a billion dollars a year on supplies, you would want assurances that the materials management uh, supplier that you're using is viable, cost efficient, and has a strong and a durable business model. The second issue is that we seek services that have a good return on investment. Thus, programs like cardiac care and orthopedic, surger uh, orthopedic surgeries, these are highly desirable. Um, while infectious, uh, infectious disease management um, can have a neg negligible financial benefit. So we think about that in light of how well hospitals have been prepared for the pandemic. It doesn't necessarily mean that those services are not gonna be provided, but financial success does depend on organizing the right mix of specialties with the right emphases uh, in connection with the mission and purpose of the system. So, uh, and of course, financial performance is, is, you know, is gonna be a key issue, needless, needless to say. Um, and hospitals are, you know, also look for managing their expense base. Um, that's essential. So it becomes attractive, uh, actually I should say, it becomes necessary to find low cost solutions. So it won't surprise anybody um, that a good deal of the manufacturers of healthcare supplies uh, are overseas companies, including majority that make ventilators and personal protective equipment. Increasing centralization of boards. You know, when I first started working in healthcare, our hospital board was comprised uh, primarily of people representing the communities that we serve. We had board members with diverse areas of expertise and experience, but our board members um, were, were lived in the communities that we serve. They knew our patients, they knew our staff. They understood the local culture and how that influenced our organizational identity. With system expansion, there's been a shift from the community-centric focus uh, to one in which indicators involve asset performance. This is a natural outgrowth of the expanding size of, health, of, of healthcare systems. It's sort of an organic natural outgrowth. Um, in order to protect the system's interests, growth is essential. I mean, after all, the competitors are not sitting still, uh, thus building a comprehensive caregiving environment and one in which um, all levels of care are integrated. And I mean from 
the medical practice, to the outpatient center, to the rehab center, the rehab facility, uh, to the hospital. Um, having all of this in one system is a way of keeping patients in the system and it's a means of expanding the patient base. Competition um, has, has emerged as a, a vital force at, you know, over the years. Um, this is the final trend to talk about. And it, you know, when we think about the relationship between competition and coordination, there's, there's always gonna be some tension there because we do have to coordinate with one another, but we at the same time compete with one another. Um, the relationship between and among healthcare systems may be defined really more by how they compete than how they cooperate. This is not to suggest that coordination doesn't occur. Uh, where it does, it's generally around common interests, you know, such as policy advocacy, uh, which ironically uh, promotes the very ability to compete even more. But it also occurs around emergencies, for example, like um, a plane crash or a, a train wreck or something of that sort where um, hospitals have to coordinate with one another, most typically for the distribution of patients. So, where do all these trends leave us? Well, for one, our model of healthcare management and policy hasn't, uh, it, it's, it, it, it doesn't provide incentives to plan for a rainy day. Um, what hospital, think about it, what hospital would invest in 75, 100, or 150 ventilators and acres of personal protective equipment? How would they pay for it? Where would they store it? It doesn't fit in this competitive, corporatized market-driven model that's been developed over the years. We have many state and regional programs throughout the country. In fact, New York has made uh, quite a bit of progress in this area, but we don't have a federal, state, regional, and local approach to planning that would have enabled a highly coordinated uh, uh, approach and response to the pandemic. And finally, um, this, this issue of public health that's been in the news since the very beginning of, uh, of, of the pandemic. Um, the voice of public health in policy planning um, has been downgraded. Uh, I think we all know that in the last few years. Its reporting relationship um, has moved layers away from the president um, and the number of staff that participate in public health programs uh, has diminished. So uh, we add it all up together. This is where we are today. Um, and looking forward, I suspect there's a good deal of learning that's gonna occur as a result of examining all of this. Um, but when we think about how healthcare has evolved over the past 40 or 50 years, it helps us by uh, giving us insight in what those underpinnings were that led to the moment that, uh, you know, that we're facing today. And um, I, you know, so I, I appreciate your attention. And I believe at this point, we will shift over to Michael. Uh, Barry, thank you very much. Great insight, great presentation. I'd like to remind the audience to please use the Q&A tab to submit any questions regarding content or technical support. And now we'll turn it over to Michael. Michael, you're on mute. Sorry, this I was uh, I was reflecting on um, the invitation to participate in this, and I realized that it was 30 years ago this summer that I finished up my work uh, as a graduate intern at the Rockefeller Institute of Government. So it's great to be great to be back, uh, even under these rather bizarre circumstances. Um, and I, I really appreciate uh, Barry Eisenberg's presentation, and I'm going to build directly off that. I think in reflecting on. Uh, what we have learned about where we are in the current healthcare system through COVID. Um, one of the things that I think is really important to, to recognize is that while there are specific challenges associated with COVID-19 and the pandemic, uh, that really what this has done is to help shine a light on uh, and make more visible uh, problems that already existed. And I think the trends that Barry was just talking about reinforced that. Um, my friend Eric Kleinenberg, who wrote the book Heat Wave about the 1995 Chicago heat wave that led to many deaths, um, 
said that disasters uh, act like particle accelerators for social scientists. A, a particle accelerator allows a physicist to see things uh, that are always there, but are sometimes invisible. And I think some of the things that we've been seeing have been, if not invisible, uh, less, uh, less of a focus in public policy, uh, starting with where Barry left off, which is public health uh, and the importance of, of public health. And so if we look at uh, what he was just talking about um, previously, we have seen an eroded support for public health. So in addition to the, the disincentives that hospitals face for investing in infectious disease programs, in the kind of coordination, in, in the stocking up of PPE and ventilators, uh, this has been compounded by the fact that we've had a, a fairly significant reduction in the public health workforce and in money from public health. Uh, you can see that the, the budgets proposed by uh, President Trump have steadily declined and there's been a lot of attention paid to the fact that he ended the sort of pandemic response team. Uh, but this actually preceded the Trump administration. For more than a decade, we have steadily eroded spending on public health, cut jobs in local public health departments, reduced the CDC's budget. Uh, and this is really showing up not only in the capacity of hospitals to respond to the disease, um, but it's also become a problem because our ability to even track the disease, the basic epidemiological surveillance, data sharing, that is absolutely crucial and will continue to be crucial as we try to roll out contact tracing efforts, has been eroded. And so one of the things that we're seeing are, are the consequences in the, consequ in the context of this big pandemic uh, of that failure to invest in public health. The other thing, and this really gets to the heart of what a lot of my research has been about over the past 20 years, uh, is that we have seen the sort of persistent inequalities in health and in use of and access to health care by gender, by race and ethnicity, class, sexual orientation, geography. Um, and this is not new. Uh, I've been interviewed by quite a number of reporters who have been asking me to comment on the really horrific uh, racial disparities in COVID deaths and geographic disparities in COVID deaths. And uh, my answer is usually that it's horrific, uh, but not at all surprising because it is a reflection of the kinds of inequalities and structural racism that we know shape our system and shape our society in really fundamental ways. Along with the fact that uh, many lower income uh, racial minority uh, workers are uh, working in essential services and can't afford the luxury of working from home and working remotely and therefore are more exposed to the virus on a regular basis. They also face significant barriers to the use of healthcare services, live in more crowded conditions where social distancing is more of a challenge. Uh, and this has been reflected in a number of things. This is just a graph I wanted to share from some work we did as part of my World Cities project that, that uh, Jeff had mentioned during his introduction. Here we were comparing um, hospital discharges for ambulatory care sensitive conditions in Manhattan over time. Uh, these are hospitalizations that reflect timely and appropriate access to ambulatory care. Are you getting in to see the doctor? Are they managing your COPD or your diabetes? Um, and the good news for all of New York and, and most of the country is that the rates have come down uh, over time. But this is from a regression analysis uh, we did controlling for gender and insurance and place. Uh, and what you see is while the rates, uh, the odds of being hospitalized with one of these conditions did come down, uh, for, for Latinos, for African-Americans, the, the distance, the difference between um, the rates for African-Americans and whites is exactly the same by the time you get to 2013 as it was in 1999. And if I went back further, that same gap would still exist. And this reflects a number of things. Again, this is controlling for insurance. And so this isn't about differential insurance coverage. 
Uh, in this case, it's about a whole range of social and economic conditions, overt and covert racism that are showing up at the doorstep of the healthcare system and leading to these different outcomes. Now I wanna get right back directly to what, what Barry was talking about in his presentation. If you look at the trends over time, and he started in the 1970s when we started becoming very concerned about stagflation and we suddenly discovered that there was a crisis in healthcare spending in the United States, most of the efforts that have taken place over the past 40 years to try to control healthcare spending have taken, I would argue, one of two forms. One, encouraging market competition of a particular kind or trying to control volume, right? The presumption of the shift from fee-for-service to prospective payment and the use of DRGs, the explosion of managed care all assume that the big problem in healthcare spending is that we're just buying too much healthcare, consuming too much healthcare, in any international comparison will suggest that that's actually not the problem in the United States. It's not that there isn't excessive uh, spending uh, or excessive consumption on healthcare, and it's not that you can't identify healthcare services that are inefficient. It's that it's not you, a unique United States problem. What makes the United States unique is our prices. Our prices are enormously high, and that has lots of consequences. This is a quote from Ann Case and Angus Deaton from a, a recent New York Times uh, op-ed in which they talk about the consequences of healthcare costs uh, in declining numbers of skilled jobs because the real dollar wages uh, of many people have been frozen for decades now in no small part because of the cost of employer-based health insurance has helped to eat that up. And so employers are less willing to invest in this. Obviously, financial barriers are a significant barrier to seeking health care in the first place for individuals. We've all read the horrible stories about surprise billing even before COVID-19, and stories of that circulating around may discourage people from seeking care when they need it, seeking tests when they ought to be getting tests, which can further undermine our public health goals, and that's a problem. And from a larger perspective, you could argue that particularly when you're looking at state governments, which are uh, much less able to borrow than the federal government, the extraordinarily high cost of medical care is undermining the willingness and the, and the ability to invest in other essential social determinants of care. So our high prices have lots of far reaching consequences and we're seeing some of those, I think, during this pandemic. And then finally, I wanted to get back again to one of the major themes in, in, in Barry's talk as well, which is the limits of relying on the market. And here I wanted to zero in, in particular, on another dimension. Barry talked about the fact that hospitals are less likely to invest in infectious disease, less likely to stock PPE, and all of those things are correct. But the other thing that we're seeing, which is really quite startling. Uh, I have lots of colleagues in other countries who are calling me up and sending me emails in some shock to see that in the middle of a pandemic where the United States has been the epicenter, where we've had more deaths than any other country in the world, that we actually have hospitals and clinics around the country that are closing. Why? Well, there's a lot of complex reasons and we can talk about that more. But among other things is Quite sensibly, we have had to put a halt on elective surgeries. People have been less, uh, been more reluctant to go into clinics for elective procedures. And those procedures, uh, Barry talked about cardiac care and, and other things where you have a high profit margin within hospitals, are what are often keeping people afloat, uh, keeping these institutions afloat. And when those dollars uh, stop flowing in, they have a hard time. Uh, continuing to operate. And so this has led to a really perverse situation at a time when we absolutely need the healthcare system to be as accessible as possible. We actually have hospitals in certain parts of the country closing. One of the responses to that from the federal government, from the sort of CARES Act, was to try to provide additional funding to hospitals to help them stay afloat. 
uh, but as the graph on, on my right suggests, there are some serious questions about where that money went. Uh, and so indeed, uh, one of the big concerns was that the hospitals that are in greatest need, some of the safety net hospitals were the ones who are least likely to receive that money. So with that, I'm going to stop and then turn it over to Courtney. Great, uh, great presentation. And while we are switching to help um, get the slides up, which I'll put up in a second, um, just a little bit of background on my role at Haney's. So during the introductions, you might have noticed that I have two titles. One is uh, operate, Chief Operating Officer. So in that role, I get to see what's happening in hospitals every day. Um, we were certainly working 24 seven around the clock at Haney's when the pandemic began, helping our hospitals with everything that was alluded to with uh, the surge and how to plan for that, staffing, supplies, everything that they needed. Um, so you saw, ver you saw firsthand in, in that role what was happening. But I also wear another hat, which is innovation officer. And in that role, we look at the future and we plan for the future. So it's actually a really fun job. And in the past couple of months, I've been able to wear both those hats in seeing what was happening on the ground while thinking about the future and how do we take what we've learned from this pandemic and use it and apply those lessons in the future. One of the advantages that I would say we had was a little over a year ago, uh, back in late 2018 and into 2019, in the innovation role, we did some planning. We started thinking about the future and where is healthcare headed? And both Barry and Michael, I think, did a wonderful job talking about some of the long-term trends in healthcare. So we did the same thing. We wanted to see what trends are happening now and what trends are likely to happen in the future. So we engaged in what's called scenario planning. And this is a nice graphic that kind of illustrates, uh, it's basically taking it, looking at what's happening yesterday, today, and then thinking about what's gonna happen in three years. Ultimately, the time frame we were thinking about was 10 years. So what are some of the major trends that are happening now and what's gonna be happening in the future? And when you look at those trends and you can think about those trends, uh, Barry and Michael alluded to some of them, which ones do you think are gonna number one, have the biggest impact and number two, be the most uncertain? And you try to pick just two of those trends and figure out which one is gonna have the most impact and which one's gonna be the most uncertain. So we did this process and you, you think about this, this tube that you see on your, your screen, think about a kaleidoscope, you know, when you're a kid and you could turn it and you could see all the colors. While we were doing that, thinking about the future, all of a sudden the pandemic happened and basically everything you saw on your kaleidoscope and all those colors were suddenly much closer to you than they had been. And a lot of the trends we saw accelerated. So I'm gonna talk about a few of those trends and because I'm the last speaker, I was supposed to be optimistic and think about the future and how do we reimagine healthcare. And I'm gonna tell you what I think we can do with each one of those trends because I'm an opportunist. Uh, some people think they're an optimist or a pessimist. I'm, I'm neither. I, I look for the silver lining in every bad situation as many people can, can attest to that have worked with me. So one of the major trends is one about the uh, demographics of our country. And they are what they are. This is a trend that began a while ago that we know is gonna happen in the future. And it's that the population is aging and becoming more diverse. So this is data that we put together back in 2019. If you look at it, you look out 2030, a uh, good percentage of the population, including those people in New York, are either gonna be older or more diverse. So what does that mean for the future and how did we learn lessons from the COVID pandemic? Well, I think they're pretty obvious. Number one, you saw that COVID disproportionately hit people who were older and it disproportionately hit minorities. So to me, the opportunity of the pandemic is that we see this trend coming. It's only gonna grow over time. The pandemic has taught us all these lessons about what we might do differently in care delivery for both of those populations. Another trend that we were monitoring, and I'm not gonna present all the trends that we did research on because uh, we did 21 trends. I just picked a few of my, the ones I thought most relevant for today. Another trend that we saw, particularly with providers, and this is provider-centric, um, you know, with my role at Haney's, we do represent provider organizations, was that government payment rates were not keeping pace with providers' costs. So Medicaid typically only pays 73 cents on the, on the dollar. That's a, a New York figure. 
which you can imagine um, for any providers that only get that much money, they've, they've got to find a way to make it up somewhere. So this particular trend, and we've been watching this one closely, uh, very much deals with the next slide that I'm going to show you, which is if you have a provider, this is not hard to figure out, who's more dependent on government pay than private pay, they're probably financially not doing as well. So we actually delved into this trend a little bit um, to look at both volumes and revenues and what was happening. And what we did is we looked at hospitals in New York and we grouped them. So you'll see the red line there, that is the distressed group of hospitals. So these tend to be the ones that you hear about in the news. For those of you who are really close to healthcare, you, you hear about the Department of Health having uh, this list of hospitals that are distressed and need funding. And that would be the group that you're thinking of. And then the top 15 hospitals. And what this trend shows is, <laughs> Basically, you would not be surprised. As systems have consolidated and they're, and they're part of the top 15, they're seeing their revenues be stabilized. But the bottom group, it's the opposite. So we had noted this. We had noted that the growing trend of a growing divide between the have and the have nots was, was only going to grow over time. And it was, in fact, one of the two factors that our board a year, a year well over a year ago, said, we think of all the different trends happening in healthcare, this one is gonna have the most impact. And they're pretty certain it's gonna happen. So let's keep an eye on it. So when it comes to COVID, what do you think we saw? We saw the exact same thing happen where providers with the means were able to purchase the PPE. They were able to hire needed staff when the surge hit because they could pay them more. And you, and you saw that happening in every aspect of, of care. So here to me, the opportunity in all of this is trying to think about policies that help make sure that the distressed group is still able to provide care, that access to care is not impacted in different parts of the state. And the state has done that through, through different funding pools, uh, but, but it helps us think about different strategies to help make sure that access to care is maintained. Another major trend that we were noticing at the time was that big tech firms were expanding their footprint in the healthcare marketplace. So not your typical providers. Um, these are some of the big things like Apple, Microsoft, Google. And opportunity in here is that a lot of those tech giants with their hip enabled clouds are able to hold a lot of data that can be beneficial for artificial intelligence, machine learning, and they can help advance healthcare in ways that they never have done before. At first, when we started talking about this trend with our providers, there was fear that, oh my gosh, Amazon's gonna take over healthcare. But as we talked about it more, they started to look for ways to partner with it and no longer fear, but instead embrace technology. And it's become one of their major strategies for resiliency in the future. What's interesting is that what happened during the pandemic with telehealth and digital care you could not have made that happen. If you think about telemedicine in particular, and I'll go into that in, in more detail. For four or five years, we've been trying to get people to use telemedicine. What happened during the pandemic in eight weeks time didn't happen in the last five years. So it massively accelerated the trends in, in technology. And this is one that shows you the consumer's preferences where suddenly uh, you see that the, the darkest line at the bottom, which is telemedicine. It was barely used by people. Yes, it was growing at a massive amount, but it was less than 1% of all hospital visits. This is pre-pandemic. So we were watching this trend. We're saying telemedicine is growing very quickly, but it's still only 1% of healthcare. I don't know if you know the answer to this question, but now what do you think telemedicine is in terms of total visits? 12%. So in eight weeks time, it went from 1% to 12%. That's more, way more than anything that happened in the last four years. And again, it's the opportunity there is to embrace it and to use it um, to more effectively deliver care. In fact, and I'll go back to the slide. We had one provider who went from less than 1% of their behavioral health visits to 100% of their behavioral health visits being done through, through telemedicine. And there's stories like that all over the state. Another trend that we had noticed was that <clears throat> payers, which are increasingly consolidating, um, you think about the, the payer market and some of the big payers, uh, Aetna, uh, United, Humana, 
there's there's five big payers who actually cover over half of all covered lives uh, in the country. And there's a constant battle, as you all know, and of course, I'm a little biased here, so please understand that, that hospitals and, and insurers are constantly battling for better prices, um, part of the market, arguing about how much should be paid, whether a claim should be denied. So we saw that trend happening where there was an increasing amount of friction between payers and providers, and it's contributed to the, the payer market consolidating more in order to keep up uh, with the insurance market. So we were, we were seeing this trend, uh, we saw it accelerate so that in fact, um, during the pandemic, Michael had alluded to how you're seeing hospitals where they're worried because they're going out of business because people aren't coming back to the hospital anymore. And they're trying to, to make sure that they can meet their bottom line while you've had record profits on the, uh, on the insurer side. So to me, the opportunity in this is, is as you're seeing that um, disparity happen between the insurance market and how much the insurers are controlling the dollar uh, versus the providers, providers typically give back to their communities through community reinvestment. It's something that they do. It's required for them um, for their nonprofit status. Is there an opportunity for some of the insurance companies to do the same thing? to provide some type of community reinvestment, just as we've done with, with banks and other entities in the past. Uh, here, this is just an example of some of the consolidation that's happened in response to all this. This is one of the few trends that I think slowed during the pandemic, only because providers were so focused on just care delivery, keeping their doors open, serving patients. But I would guess because of the finances and what, what's happening with um, hospitals and the disparities, you will see this resume. You will see the consolidation and provider trends again pick up in the future. There's very few independent hospitals left in New York. That is true across the country. Now I think you're going to start to see how some of those lines on that map go across state lines. You're only going to see more and more of that. Again, here I wonder if there isn't some kind of opportunity for better sharing of data and information to learn more about patients and to help improve care delivery. Um, and, the, and the last major trend that I thought was worth mentioning um, before I transition a little bit is the focus on social determinants of health. So we knew prior to the pandemic that social determinants were becoming an increasing part of the dialogue and an increasing part of the care model for providers um, in our healthcare system. What we saw during the pandemic is that all of a sudden those social determinants of health became such a determinant uh, and it was noticed in the data that in some of these hard hit communities tending to be minority communities, people were getting much worse care. And when you delve into that data more, and I think this information is gonna become more and more relevant um, in, the, in the coming months and become more apparent, a lot of the times it wasn't necessarily about the care. It was about all those underlying factors of did the person have an underlying health condition be before they came in? Did they have access to housing, nutrition, if you take out all those other risk factors that I would call the social determinants of health, I would bet at the end of the day that the survival rates and the clinical outcomes and so on might be pretty even, surprisingly. But all of it is an important opportunity for us to look at the disparities and how they can be better addressed. So when you think about all these trends, and there's many that I didn't actually go into, we had asked our board to look at them, and I mentioned that we wanted to tell which one would have the most impact and which one would be the most uncertain. So this is a great graphical depiction. Uh, it was actually done at our board retreat with uh, our hospital CEOs, where we were looking at all these things that were influencing healthcare in 2019, consumerism, politics, and so on. They picked the growing divide between the have and the have nots and technology as their two biggest factors. From those factors, you come up with ways to be res resilient no matter how the future unfolds. So the future could be really good where that growing divide shrinks and technology works wonderfully. Or it could be the opposite where the technology doesn't work as it's supposed to, it, it, the divide between the have and the have nots grows even more. And we say no matter what future happens, what strategies can you implement now that are gonna help you survive in the future? So they picked four strategies, controlling the dollar, which is both trying to understand how to keep your expenses down in a highly competitive world, 
but also keeping the consumer interested in wanting to, to go to your hospital as opposed to somewhere else. So that that way you have more control over care um, and making sure that you can improve the way that they're experiencing healthcare. And we've seen this happen with value-based payment and other trends in healthcare. Secondly, was understanding consumers. Um, the pandemic gave us gave providers a much better chance to understand that consumers come from different places in life. What is it that's going to best serve them? Uh, how do we do that more effectively? They certainly embrace technology. I mentioned some of those statistics on uh, telemedicine, but there were a, an explosion of digital applications in healthcare, remote monitoring, and other things that never, frankly, would have happened as quickly if it wasn't for the pandemic. And then finally, innovating around workforce. And this is where I would say the, the government played a big role in implementing temporary waivers and executive orders that allowed more flexibility around the workforce. Now that we've seen what can happen when you, when you do that, when you allow that flexibility, we would like to see a lot of those waivers um, continue in the future because we think that a lot of them might, a lot of the regu regulatory regimes that were in place prior probably didn't have to be there. So two more slides just on the opportunities um, around what all of this means. Major things in these four areas that we th thought changed dramatically during COVID is number one in controlling the dollars. We saw, I think, a massive shift in who's controlling the dollar. It went very much from providers who uh, we'll see how they make out after, after this is all said and done. But as you know, many of them are, are financially distressed right now. Um, many are trying to get people to come back to the hospital because uh, they have no revenue without that um, to do some elective surgeries and other things that people had postponed. But health plans, uh, which basically make their money, if you don't, if you pay for the care and then don't use it, made out financially very well during this time. So this is one that we want to keep an eye on um, to see if there is an opportunity to get health plans more engaged in investing in their communities going forward and, and also looking at some of these trends like the social determinants of health. Secondly, in understanding consumers, I found one of this uh, study in New York City incredibly interesting. And that was that over half of people uh, delayed or did not get care during, during the pandemic. Not, not a surprise, but when you look at the, the death data um, from the first from March and April in New York City, they said there were 6,000 more deaths than might typically happen. And this is outside of hospitals and in the community. To me, that indicates that if people delayed care, there was a real impact um, in terms of mortality. In terms of, oops, let me do that. In terms of embracing technology, this is where I said the telehealth visits went from 1% to 12% and you had facilities where they were using some form of, of telemedicine was less than 1% of what they did and they're now doing 100% of their visits for some types of services. And innovating around workforce, we'd love to see some of these waivers continue uh, around scope of practice and how you can enhance staffing. In terms of other opportunities to reimagine uh, now that the pandemic, um, we hope in New York, the worst is, is past us, but as you know, it's surging in many other states. Uh, for example, Arizona, I was on a phone call with them today to tell them about what we learned since they're starting to see a surge there. But there are opportunities to reimagine healthcare. Um, one is looking at how to invest more in social determinant strategies. Michael alluded to the public health infrastructure. I see the public health infrastructure being very much connected to how we can better address social determinants of health strategies. Second is involving consumers in decision making and in start incorporating some of the findings that uh, we discovered about health disparities in care delivery. Third is just maximizing consumers' newfound acceptance of technology. Uh, people were afraid to use technology, didn't know how to use it. They were almost forced to use it during the pandemic. And it's been very beneficial in many ways because not only um, are they able to safely make a doctor's visit through, through the technology, but because of the digital care, there's new applications that had never been used before that can help monitor somebody's health uh, remotely. And then finally, um, you know, thinking about what does this new world look like and how does the government play a role? How do they help promote innovation and allow providers to do things that may actually be better for patients? We should take a serious look at many of the waivers uh, that were implemented by the government, both the federal government and the state government during the pandemic to see what makes sense to, to carry forward.
Uh, so that is it for my presentation and I look forward to questions. Courtney, thank you. Um, Michael, Barry, terrific presentations. There are a few questions, if I may, and I'll open it up to the panel. The first question is, is Medicare for all a solution to these problems? Why not? Whoever wants well, to take I'll, it. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll take it. I saw that Dr. Fine asked that one. Good, good to hear from you, Dr. Fine. Uh, I Listen, uh, I think Medicare for all uh, could be a, a solution. Certainly there are single payer systems that work in other parts of the world. My sense in terms of my international comparisons over the past few decades, however, is that there are lots of ways to do this. Uh, and I think the healthcare system in the U.S. really needs to respond to what my friend Joe White calls the international standard. Uh, cover everyone, right? We, we simply can't have these sort of gaps in coverage you have to operate within broad budget parameters. You can't pretend as if it can just be an open-ended financing system. Even if the only thing we care about is health, health care isn't the only way to achieve that, which is why each of us have mentioned social determinants. And within that, and here's where I'll, I'll disagree with my good friend Courtney a little bit, is we need to be a little harder about negotiating prices. Um, Right when what what one of the things that other countries do is they have all payer rate regulation systems. People like to talk about administrative waste, and there's no question having multiple payers can lead to some administrative waste. But if you want to talk about the massive administrative spending within the context of the U.S. healthcare system, it's that every one of these hospitals and every one of our multi-specialty clinics has to keep track of an enormous array of ever-changing prices from different payers, they have to hire armies of people to pay attention to all of this. In most other countries, they have single rates that apply across the board. They're negotiated annually. They're transparent. They're easy to see. Uh, and this is not only a way to use government leverage to reduce excessive prices, not just for drugs, but hospital and physician services, but, but it's also a way of reducing administrative spending and you can do all of that in the context of a multi-payer system. Germany has several hundred sickness funds and they do this, but they have all payer rate regulation. So it, it's one way of doing it. It's not the only way of doing it. That would be my response. Um, oh, sorry, go ahead. Uh, no, I'll, I'll, you know, I'll jump in as well. Uh, and thanks for the easy softball question to lead things off. Um, you know, uh, I, I, I agree with a lot of what Michael just said. Um, I think sometimes it's important for us to pull back uh, before we answer that question and examine what is the role of a healthcare system in society. And I sometimes feel we jump over that. Um, and when we jump over that, we start talking about policy instead of that, the role of that healthcare system. Um, one of the things that is so stark um, and distressing about the pandemic in addition to everything else is that it pulled the curtain back on, um, the, you know, on this, uh, you know, horrific sense that there are some people who are so far outside of the healthcare system that they can't even find a way to get into it um, and haven't been in it for a long, you know, have, have never really had a foothold in it. Um, I remember, and I, I'll try to do this briefly, but when I first moved into my role as an administrator, I'll never forget um, that uh, I went in, I was doing rounds and I went into the uh, emergency room at two in the morning just to see everybody, see what was going on. And there was a young woman sitting, um, and I just remember this is like it was just yesterday and literally it's over 30 years ago, but there was a young woman sitting there and um, she had two children with her. She must've been in her mid twenties. Um, and she was sick and she was coughing. And you could see there was some respiratory distress. Uh, there were two children with her. One was like an infant and the other was maybe three years old. Um, and she was holding both of them on, the, on her lap. And um, I asked how she, you know, how, how she was doing. She said, she's, you know, she's okay. She had already been um, seen and she was waiting to go back for, you know, just to, she was waiting to go back to see the physician again. Um, and, uh, you know, thankfully she was in good hands, but um, the next day I went to the emergency room again and I asked how she was. And they said, well, she was, um, 
you know, she was in an early stage of pneumonia. And he's, the physician shook his head and he said, you know, the saddest part about this is that had she come two weeks ago, um, she never would have been anywhere near this sick. We probably could have treated this with, uh, you know, 50 cents worth of antibiotics. And um, she would not have missed work. The two kids would not have been exposed to this kind of illness. They wouldn't have had to be, you know, brought into the emergency room at, you know, at two in the morning. Um, and that, you know, kind of shaped my sense of healthcare pretty much more than anything else. And you multiply that experience times gigantic swaths of this population across the country, that there are so many people who can quickly and easily make a call and get um, whatever they need, um, access to an extraordinary lit litany of the best healthcare resources in the world. Um, and yet there are millions of people who are so far away from that that they would need binoculars to see it. And so I think what we really need to do is explore what, what does our healthcare system do? Who is it for? How can we break down some of those barriers? Um, if we break down those barriers by instituting a, um, a Medicare for all, we may be introducing complexities and disruptions to a, uh, a you know, to a, a major element of society that might be very difficult for us if we don't do it right, if we don't do it with the proper transitions, if we don't do it with the right thinking, um, uh, you know, and, um, and the right strategy and the right political will and the right way of helping society adjust to something that we've never had, because that would also mean taking things away from people that they've had. How do we get all of that right and do all that right? And I think sometimes the discussion around jumping from which policy is the right one, whether it's Medicare for all, whether it's the public option. Uh, personally, I think that the public option, at least on an interim basis, is the right way to go, even though the goal is to ensure everybody, put that aside. Um, I think we need to have a sober, um, to the extent that it's possible, and this is probably pie in the sky, uh, a political examination of what should our healthcare system be for everybody, um, and then start thinking about how that makes it, how we can make that work. And one of the things that we need to think about is uh, when we break down those barriers, how do we bring healthcare more into the communities of people that it serves? Historically, healthcare, it's you know, we open up our doors, people come in, they show up, they come in, they get taken care of, and then they go out. Um, but that role may need to be changed. And if I think about, again, the silver lining, it's that as healthcare providers, we need to not be separated necessarily by walls with a community, but we need to bring ourselves into communities, strengthen health literacy, make resources more available, Increase the, um, you know, it, it, increase the awareness uh, and the knowledge that people have so that when they do engage the system, they're able to do it um, with more confidence, with a much greater sense of dignity, with a much greater sense of humanity, uh, and with a distribution of, of, of healthcare resources that comports with the very democracy that we are supposed to be. And I think we need to have those kinds of discussions. So sorry for going on a little bit long with that, but um, you know this is the, 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 it's a simple question with a gigantically complex um, you, you know set of assumptions that guide our approach to answering it. Um, Michael and Barry, thank you. Um, just a brief comment: um, Medicare for all may be a solution. One critical question would be how we how we would pay for it. Um, and I think that's one of the fundamental issues that um, we need to continue talking about. But there is another question, if I may. Um, is there a big difference between telemedicine reimbursement rates and in-person rates? Maybe I'll take a crack at that one. Um, there was a point in time where there used to be a gigantic difference, which was a, obviously a disincentive for people or providers to use it. There's now a lot of legislation to have more payment parity so that those services are reimbursed. Um, most of what you're paying for is a, is a professional's time. And that doesn't change once you, once you, whether you're seeing them on a camera or whether you're seeing them in person. Um, it's you know, procedures that are different. So for most purposes, telemedicine is very similar and we've made tremendous progress on payment parity. 
Thank you, Courtney. There are a couple of quick questions, um, additional questions, if I may. Um, let's see. As the pandemic continues to fan out across the United States to more rural communities, do you expect to see other challenges or trends emerge? This is open to the panel. Well, I'll just go back to one of the things I was talking about when I was mentioning hospital closures. And again, this was an issue that was taking place before COVID-19 and has been exacerbated by it. A lot of those closures and a lot of the, <clears throat> the issues in access to care were in rural communities. And so one major concern is, will we have appropriate testing sites? Will we have appropriate treatment uh, as this rolls out in rural areas? where it is an enormous challenge. We obviously had significant challenges in New York and other urban areas where hospital systems were overwhelmed or close to being overwhelmed. Right now, Houston is in big trouble uh, and other large cities in the South and the West. Uh, but I, I'm deeply concerned about what's going to happen inevitably when the virus rolls out in more rural areas. So I think it's a, I think it's a significant problem and I think we can learn a lot from what we have already experienced, uh, whether or not we're going to act on it is a little less clear to me. Thank you, Michael. I know there's just a few minutes left. Um, one final question, this is to the panel. What can be done with regard to how the government and the private, spe private sector can and should work together with regard to strategic initiatives with regard to this current crisis or any future crises that may occur. It seems as though there was a, an overall disconnect. So what can we do moving forward to make improvements? Well, I can speak um, from some of the experiences we had in the last couple months firsthand. Um, there was an enormous amount of collaboration, uh, so I don't want people on the webinar to get the wrong idea that there wasn't a lot of collaboration between government and private industry um, here in New York. I think we, we did a decent job with that. There probably are some opportunities. Um, the one that I think is looming over my head when I think about the fall and a potential resurge is that uh, it's still a challenge to get equipment and personal protective equipment supplies, particularly when you're seeing surges in other parts of the country and other parts of the world. Um, the government has initiated some different um, plans, some of which we're involved in to look at how do we work together with our multi-state collaborative, how do we work together across providers, because typically providers were competing with each other for those same supplies and competing with neighboring states, competing with the police department down the street. So I think there's some coordination, a role that um, government can play to, to help coordinate some of that in the future. Thank Jeff, you. can I just jump in also to add something yeah, to that? Sure, Barry. You know, I really appreciate what, you know, what Courtney had mentioned. One of the things I think about the issue that we're facing today is that to, to be prepared means to look at, I mean, obviously, you know, it means to, to look down the road um, and to invest in something that may or may not occur. Um, individual hospitals lack the incentives to do that. Uh, and um, without a... With, without a planning process that includes government support, government direction, um, then, uh, you know, we tend to back off during normal times, we tend to back off. That's what happened in the last three or four years. You know, after the Ebola crisis and the SARS and, you know, some of the other pandemics, um, greater attention was paid to public health. Public health um, is a driving force in preparing us for bad times. Um, but, hot, but hospitals have, would have a very difficult time to do that alone. Even you know, localities where hospitals might get together would have a difficult time doing that alone. The structures, the, the, stru the incentive structure um, just is not there without the government's role. So what I, I hope is, and, and according to her credit and to the credit of New York State has taken a lead on some of this, but, um, if, if um, uh, we need to build on the momentum uh, that, uh, that translates into political initiatives in order to sustain a government market-based private approach um, 
to build, looking ahead and to take that away from something that sounds amorphous. Just think about the idea of, of is, it's, it's, I hate to focus on one, but like, you know, ventilators where everybody was caught, was caught off guard and caught short. Um, you know, no one hospital, no collection of hospitals even would, would have um, the ability necessarily to store all that. And that's just for one type of, of, of healthcare crisis. What if there's another healthcare crisis that requires a different kind of approach? How do we do that? Um, we can only do that when there's a partnership between federal, state, local, town, and healthcare system uh, entities. And um, again, that's gonna require a, a more disciplined approach to the discussion or recognition for how those, uh, you know, for how government and the private sector can work together more fully. Um, and again, you know, hoping that we can build on what has occurred now so that we learn a lesson that we don't regret that we ignored in a few years from now. Very thank you. And thank you to all the panelists and to the Rockville Institute and all the uh, participants. I'm gonna turn it over to Laura to wrap it up. Thank you. I would like to thank everyone again who attended the webinar and special thanks to our moderator, Jeff Ritter and our three panelists, Barry, Michael and Courtney for sharing their insights today into how we got here, what, ha what we have seen through the COVID-19 and how we can move forward from this and proceed and take some important lessons away and see some long-term changes for the better. I hope you enjoyed the conversation as much as I did. Uh, Check our website. We're going to be posting a recording of our website, uh, of the webinar on our rep website, rockins.org. And I encourage everyone, while you're there looking at the webinar, check out our latest research um, and to learn a little bit more about it, our institute. And also, one more thank you to everyone who was involved, um, including our team at Rockefeller, who helped organize and get this webinar up and running. And we look forward to having a lot more future conversations. Take care, everyone. Have a great weekend.